Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Zia, and I think you know me from the breast cancer lecture about two weeks back. I'm also one of the faculty coordinators of the course, and uh, Dr. Moody is actually out of town this week, so I will be hosting. Um, so our speaker today is Dr. Jun Wei. Jun, Jun Wei, sorry. Um, he is a staff scientist uh, in the oncogenomics section of the genetics branch. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in biology at the University of Houston in 1992. Subsequently, he obtained a PhD at Baylor College of Medicine in 1999. Um, he completed a postdoctoral training in Paul Meltzer's lab at the Cancer Genetics Branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, and then he joined the oncogenomics section in 2001 and became a staff scientist in 2009. His primary research interest is to understand the biology of high-risk pediatric cancers using genomic approaches. Um, and his talk today is Applying Genomics to Precision Medicine. Thank you very much for the kind of introduction. And uh, I'm really happy to give a talk in this class again. Um, so probably you already know that I've been in this field for a while, and I just gave you a general overview of this uh, field of genomics, and then how we use this genomics for the uh, treat the uh, pediatric cancer. So this is an outline for uh, today's uh, talk. And first, I will give you some overview of the success and the challenges of treating pediatric cancer in the field, uh, in the pediatric field. And uh, then I'm going to uh, introduce you uh, what is exactly is genomics. And uh, there's a, um, um, uh, there is a very powerful uh, technology now applied into the genomics is this uh, next generation sequencing technology is widely used in the genomics, and we can use this kind of platform uh, in genomics to um, uh, do precision medicine uh, in, to, to directly benefit the patient. So uh, child, childhood cancer, uh, actually, it's a very um, successful story for uh, treating cancers. You can see this bar chart in, this, uh, in the 60s. Some uh, cancer, the uh, survival rate is pretty low, lower than 30%. But by the 1990s, and uh, all those cancer, uh, leukemia, uh, lymphoma, Wilms tumor, their survival rate is uh, very high, 80 or 90%. However, uh, this trend, you can, you can see this mortality, uh, uh, mortality rate uh, keep on going down in the, uh, the the uh, later part of the last century. But uh, at about the, uh, the 1990s, the, uh, the, the rate, decrease of the rate start to uh, plateau. So the decreasing is not what we really want to, uh, to see. The reason is because uh, we probably reached the, the maximum uh, optimum trading for these cancers. Uh, for those curable cancers. But for uh, the a subgroup of cancer, especially those metastatic, recurrent, and the refractory cancers, they remain incurable with the current therapies. You can see I put up some uh, category of uh, cancer. This is the most uh, uh, common extracranial cancer, uh, solid tumor, like a neuroblastoma, Ewing sarcoma, uh, metastatic rhabdomyosarcoma and the osteosarcoma stage four, they all have very uh, low survival rate, even with not the standard. So uh, to understand this, um, uh, I have to come back to the uh, biology part, you know, and uh, the, in, the, in our nat natural world, we can observe some stunning uh, phenomenon like this kind of thing. It's like a dramatic consequence of gene expression in biology, right? And uh, you can see this creature and this creature, this uh, butterfly, uh, they, sh they have exactly the same genome, but their phenotype is so different. The reason is they have a very different expression pattern, and they have 
the result to the dif uh, different uh, proteome and then result into the different uh, tissues and that they have this different uh, tissue have a different uh, physiology to enable them to do this kind of thing. Same thing in human. Okay, and uh, we all have the same genome or DNA in every cell of our body, but uh, because of their differentially expression pattern, and they generate a different uh, phenotype, uh, and they give out a very complex and diverse uh, cell type, tissue types in our body that serve certain functions. So this is uh, the central dogma, you know, the slide to talk about the central dogma, the information flow uh, is from the DNA or chromosome DNA uh, to the messenger RNA and then uh, going to the protein. So uh, the gen there's a line here to uh, kind of uh, roughly divide uh, the genomic and the proteomics. So everything here about the uh, nucleic acid, that's roughly definition as a genomics, but the, all, everything study about the protein and its derivative, it's a, a definition defined as the proteomic. And we know, uh, especially recently, we know this kind of uh, uh, information flow is not that uh, simple. It actually is very complex. So general idea is the information flow from DNA and mRNA to protein, but there's a lot of feedback loop from the protein side. And also recently we discovered this uh, 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 microRNA, uh, the non-coding RNA, they also have a lot of trans, uh, transcription and the translation regulatory mechanism to control this process. mRNAs, and uh, if you counting as the alternative splicing variants, you, you will have the diversity will increase to 150,000 uh, different transcripts, and all those transcripts that can be uh, further, oh, sorry, and the, the, this uh, regulatory uh, compartment of the RNA, including about 2,000 microRNA, uh, this is like a big field now, uh, we know this is a very tiny RNA, only like 20 nuclear, uh, nucleotide, and uh, they have a lot of regulatory uh, roles in the transcription and the translation. And also there's a 270,000 uh, long non-coding RNAs. Uh, this number uh, kept the increase uh, recently because more and more species was uh, discovered. So all those uh, non-coding RNA, they have a huge uh, regulatory roles in this process. And all this is to control about like a half million uh, species of uh, proteins. And we are not uh, even talking about the post-translation modification like uh, phosphorylation, acetylation, uh, sumylation, all these kind of things. So it's very complicated. but. The, uh, the the uh, recent data shows that uh, the genome actually is very active. Eighty percent of the genome actually is functional. They all get transcribed. So the challenge now is uh, how to measure or detect the genes or their product in in this uh, uh, this system because we have so many genes and uh, its products to be measured. Um, so the, the solution is that we have to have a high throughput ways to measure them simultaneously. That's the massively parallel nature of that. And also, if we, have, uh, if we can measure them, and then we need a computational power. So these two uh, critical factor is uh, become uh, practical in the late uh, in the uh, late like 19 uh, uh, last century the last a couple, uh, a couple of decades of the last century because the increasing of computing power and the technology enable us to do uh, such a, a, a develop such a technology can massively parallel uh, measuring things 
And uh, this is the uh, 2001, both Science Magazine and the Nature Magazine, they published the first version of the human genome at that time. Uh, this is the result of the uh, international collaboration of this human genome project. At that time, it took, uh, I think it's seven country, uh, 13 center, like a, more than a decade, just sequenced the one genome, okay? And they spend like billions of dollars and they sequence the one genome. Um, and the, after that, if the genome serve as a, a map uh, for us to go into uh, each cells or specimen, we can measure the nuclear acid. Uh, we, we, we need a map. If you don't have a road map, and uh, it's very hard to do this type of work. So the first the human genomes really provi provide a map making those high throughput technology possible. And the first generation of genomic tools, uh, people using a microarrays. Microarrays, basically the concept is we can synthesize those small probes. We can put it into some uh, solid base, like a glass slide. We can put it into a pattern. You know where the probe is, and then you can hybridize your uh, nuclear acid specimen on it, and you can detect the certain species of this, uh, the, speci uh, the nuclear acid in that uh, sample. So the early, ver uh, early uh, microarray, uh, including those printing the microarray or those in situ synthesize the microarray. So the in pr printing microarray actually, that's the first generation microarray when I was uh, in the field to start working is this kind of mechanical printing. Basically, you look at this, this is each individual pen has this, uh, uh, it's, it's just like an ink pen, okay? It go into the well to uh, take up the, uh, the probe, uh, synthesize the probe or cDNA probe, and then just go to the uh, slide, this robot to printing on the slides all those probes. So each slide can contain the tens of thousands of spots. You know which spots it contain what kind of sequence. Um, that's the very primitive uh, technology we first used. And later they use uh, a more sophisticated using this electronic piezo printing. This is basically just the same technology as in the inkjet printer now they were using. But the, instead of you, they use ink, they use this nucleic acid solution to print it on the uh, uh, glass slide um, to make this microarray. And uh, later, uh, the field developed this kind of uh, in situ synthesis. And they, they, they have this lithographic mask, which is the same technology to make the computer chips. This is from the Silicon uh, Valley uh, technology. They can uh, making those uh, microarray on the silicon wafer uh, using this kind of uh, uh, lithographic uh, technology, and the, the the more advanced version is using uh, this technology. You need a physical mask every time you synthesize a, a grown a, a nuclear acid. You need a mask to to um, put the pattern on the chip. But lately, they, they use this digital mag mirror device, which is a very versatile technology, can uh, produce uh, any kind of sequence you want on the chip in a very fast fashion. You don't need to have physical mass to do this. That currently still a lot of uh, um, companies still using this technology to make in the microarray. So this is slide shows uh, how the microarray uh, works. Uh, if you have a, a two different kind of specimen, one is from a healthy individual, one is from a cancer individual, you can isolate the nucleic acid and label them with a different fluorophore. And you can put those uh, uh, samples into a, a hybridization chamber. And this is a microarray with all those uh, probe uh, on the slide. 
So this is just by Watson Creek hybridization. They will find each uh, um, target and hybridize, and you wash the excess specimen away, and you use a confocal microscope to scan the slides to detect the the fluorescent the micro uh, the fluorescent the fluorophore on the probe. So because you know each uh, spot address, then you can um, backtrack what kind of uh, um, sequence in your in your um, in your specimen so that's the basically the mechanism uh, for the microarray and the, the, here I give you a, a example early success successful example to use this uh, technology in the clinical realm so uh, at that time we, we were in the pediatric oncology group uh, the branch uh, in the CCR and we have a, a kid from a German uh, has a, a huge mass in, uh, at, in, in the upper pole of the left kidney. At that time, the, pri uh, the primitive uh, uh, primary diagnosis is a Wilms tumor. And uh, they need a second opinion because they use the treatment for Wilms tumor, but the, the patient seems not to respond well. <clears throat> So we took the uh, sample from this patient and we performed the DNA microarray uh, analysis. And then we do a clustering like uh, shown here. You can see this uh, particular uh, sample cluster with uh, uh, neuro neuroblastoma instead of Ewing. Uh, Wilms. Wilms tumor is the uh, yellow tumor here. And the blue is the neuroblastoma. So they changed the diagnosis from a Wilms tumor to a neuroblastoma, and they changed the therapy and the, the patient response to the therapy. So this is the first uh, uh, example we use this technology. And <clears throat> since then, this new technology comes, uh, uh, comes around. There's one technology called the next generation sequencing is widely used in the genomics nowadays. The idea is uh, if you have a nuclear acid, you know, after your fragmentation, you do site selection, put on the adapter, you can massively sequence them in a next generation sequencing machine. And then you can align all those rays to the reference genome. And you know where those fragments of the nuclear acid are coming from. Then you can recap recapitulate what the original uh, nuclear acid in your sample. So this is a, a, a real picture from this uh, uh, instrument. You can see this uh, each individual dots uh, is represent one Sanger sequence. So you uh, actually you sequence many, many, you know, hundreds of millions of sequence in a one go, in a one flow cell. Uh, and this is the whole flow cell. I just show a little square. You can see there's so many uh, sequences you can generate. And the information from this uh, kind of technology generated is very uh, diverse. You can, there's a very rich genomic information you can derive from this technology. You can detect the point of mutation, indel, and the, uh, the deletions, and the gain of the chromosome or even translocation, and uh, even pathogen uh, um, DNAs or RNAs in, in, in your sample. And this is shows that uh, we can even using this uh, sequencing to do the, if we sequence the RNA, uh, sequence the transcriptome, we can uh, acquire a lot of information that the uh, microarray cannot do. You know, for example, we can digital can acquire digital gene expression and express the mutation if the mutation is silent or expressed in the transcriptome. And uh, you can, we can detect the fusion transcript and the alternative splicing variants and the RNA editing events and the novel transcripts and also the non-coding RNAs. So, Compared to the microarray, the next generation sequencing technology has a lot of advantages. Uh, 
Uh, first, there's no need to prepare clones for the DNA fragment. You don't need to prepare those uh, uh, probes to, to, for, for detection. And you don't, therefore, you don't need the prior knowledge for the probe design. And you can detect the uh, balanced genome structure changes. Uh, the microarray usually cannot do that. And the, because of the parallel fashion, you can um, uh, detect the hundreds of gig base per run in a, in a uh, modern uh, sequencer. And uh, those, uh, uh, another very important thing is uh, you, 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 this is single platform actually can acquire a bunch of different kinds of genomic information. Yes. Balanced. It, it's like a, just the two chromosomes that cross each other. So there's no net loss on net gain. It's just a, um, a reciprocal um, fusion. Make sense? No, it's not normal. This is usually happening in cancer. But the, uh, see, if there's no net gain or loss of genetic material, like a microarray, you cannot detect it because there's no net gain or loss. But in this platform, you can you can detect such thing. Sequencing, you can because yeah, you can detect like what I show you in the previous slide. You can detect this kind of abnormal junction, right? Because in your normal cells, you never have a uh, the, the one read coming from chromosome one or chromosome five. But in the next generation, you can detect this kind of read. Yeah, okay. All right, any questions? Okay. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to the detail, but uh, this slide just show you that the, uh, with a single platform, you can acquire all sorts of different uh, uh, genomic information uh, on, on the samples, okay? And this is very important for us to develop the biomarkers and to understand the biology of cancers and even to uh, have this therapeutic uh, interest. So um, this slide show you that uh, with this kind of a gene genomic uh, uh, studies um, uh, in the field, that the, we uh, we understand that the pediatric cancer usually have very low number of somatic and actionable mutation at the initial diagnosis. And uh, this slide shows this is uh, adult cancers. And uh, this axis shows that uh, this is the somatic mutation frequency per megabase. You can see this is all the adult cancer. Melanoma has a very high mutation rate. But if you look at the pediatric cancer, it's a very, very rare mutations uh, in, in those cancers. So the mutation burden is low. <clears throat> So the question um, at that time for, for the field is, uh, can genomics help clinical care for the, for the uh, cancer, pa this pediatric patient? So at that time, uh, we um, tried to answer this question. We tried to use the next generation sequencing uh, to, to really find what is the actional mutation, uh, actional, uh, actionable, uh, genomic change in the pediatric cancers so that it can help uh, uh, the patient in clinics. So this study will use the multi-dimensional clinomics uh, to do the precision therapy in the children and the young adults. So this is a study design. Uh, first, uh, we, uh, we define what is a clinical uh, action mutation. Um, basically, uh, oh, this, actually, let me track back a little bit. This is study, actually, we try to determine the utility and the feasibility of perform this kind of analysis to de define the clinical actionable mutation. Because uh, this is a very complex this experiment. It takes uh, uh, time. So we don't know if uh, we have enough time to, uh, to do that before the treatment has to be uh, happening in, the, in, in those kids. And uh, 
we have uh, at that time we have like uh, close to 60 patients enrolled in this uh, omic protocol in the uh, pediatric oncology branch uh, the age uh, range is from seven months all the way to the 25 years old and I have 20 diagnosis uh, categories um, most of them are known central nerve system tumors and they are solid tumors and we can perform the comprehensive multi-omic uh, uh, including the exome uh, germline the tumor sequencing, RNA sequencing, and the Illumina Omino, uh, Omini SNP array for the copy number detections. So first we have to define what is the actionable. So actionable germline mutation, which the, the definition is the loss of function mutation of known hotspot hot activating mutations of cancerous uh, cancer genes uh, or path pathogenic or likely pathogenic defined by the American College of Medical Genetics genes. Okay, the reason we define it is because uh, otherwise it's very hard to categorize what you find in the genomics. Uh, I, I will show you some example later. And the actual uh, somatic mutation is with definition is uh, those are alterations that only happen in the tumor. Uh, but we can be targeted with the FDA approved drugs or in context of existing clinical trial, we can uh, target in the, uh, either the mutation or the pathway. So here is the like a overview of this study. Uh, this di direction is all the samples. This is 59 patients. And this is a different change. And the, uh, let me explain it to you. This is uh, from the RNA sequencing uh, uh, result. And you can see this is a bunch of uh, typical fusion genes we can detect. For example, EWS fly one. This is uh, uh, the hallmark for the urine sarcoma, and uh, so on and so forth. I'm not going to uh, go um, in the detail, but you can see we can easily detect those fusions. Uh, in the tumor using the RNA sequencing. And uh, this is uh, uh, using the DNA sequencing and the RNA sequencing to, to, to detect the expressed somatic uh, uh, driver uh, mutations in, those, uh, um, in these tumors. And uh, this one is the copy number, uh, it's driver and actionable. And also we detect the germline mutations and this can uh, it be the driver and the, the actionable. Okay, and these are three cases actually we, uh, actually, sorry, four cases actually we detect the fusion that is specific to one tumor so that we have to change the diagnosis for that patient. So that, that just show you how important uh, this kind of a study is because um, you know the patient that come into NIH usually they are very uh, has a very rare tumor the diagnosis sometimes pose the challenging so from here we can see that the, this uh, next generation sequencing is very important to uh, correctly diagnose the cancer. And then this study also showed about the 10 percent of the pediatric uh, or a young adult cancer patient has an actionable germline mutation. So that will uh, um, imply that the, the genetic aspect of those um, cancer patients is very important. So about the 50%, uh, 30 out of 59 of the, the, uh, those tumors, we can identify the actionable somatic mutation. All the details are listed here. I'm not going into the details. So in summary, from that study, what we learned is uh, first, it's a very uh, feasible. We can perform this kind of study in each individual uh, cancer patient and in a real time fashion. And about 50% uh, of the patient we can identify uh, the actionable somatic mutation, and the 10% has the germline mutation. I think those things 
uh, it's, uh, I think the cancer field now start to uh, pay more attention to this because this is, has uh, not only uh, impact the patient and also their family. Uh, so this study uh, enabled us to envision uh, using the genomic to do the pre precision medicine. So the concept is in the old time that the, the metastatic patient, you come in, they have all sorts of different uh, mutation drivers. Um, but using the genomics, we can, uh, we can identify the biomarkers. We can sort them into the good signature and the poor signature. And those good signatures is defined by using the conventional uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, conventional therapy, they respond well. So they can keep on uh, receiving the conventional therapy. And the, but for those poor signature people, uh, patient, we can identify exactly what the, dry, the driver mutation in those patients or driver events in those patients then we can put them into a targeted individual therapy. Um, uh, so hopefully can improve the survival of the patient. And uh, because of this, uh, this study and uh, uh, we performed, uh, uh, we, we established a program within the CCR to, it's called the Clinomic program. And uh, we put these uh, things into the real, um, a patient care uh, uh, RAM. So when the patient are coming to the CCR and the, from the, um, their uh, tissue, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, FFP tissue, diagnosis tissue, we can perform this kind of study uh, to identify the driver mutation. Uh, and then we report it back and the, the treating physician can use that information to stratify what is the next step for their treatment. Just to remember all the patients that come into CCR, they are pretty uh, exhausted, all the uh, treat, treat uh, options, they come here for the experimental therapy. So in this way, we can stratify better for those patients, hopefully can increase the odds of uh, survival. And this is the sequencing equipment we use. Uh, we usually, we, um, most of the time, we use this next generation, uh, next, next seek 500s because their turnaround time is quick. It's only 14 hours uh, uh, per run. And we can sequence 65 gigabase uh, per run. And uh, if we have a lot of samples, we can use this high seek. Uh, and this is uh, the program up to, uh, the, I think the September of this year, we profiled about uh, 400 patients of uh, 93 different diagnoses. Uh, you can see these are all the different diagnoses seen in the clinical center. And uh, in order for the uh, clinician to really see the data, because the, the genomic data is, is a huge, it's like, a, uh, hundreds of gigabytes uh, data. And uh, we developed this uh, visual visualization system. We call it uh, uh, this uh, clinomic data portal. And it is a front page of it. And this is a per patient summary page. You can see this is a patient. This is a particular uh, case indicate which tumor it has the biopsy from. And this is the sample in, in this analysis. This is the sequencing coverage and the mutation variants. And uh, we have uh, incorporated the QC parameter into this system. You can, from this website, you can see how good the run is, this run stats. And we also uh, incorporate this genotyping into this uh, system uh, to ensure the right sample matched up with the uh, right patient. That's very critical because this is a clinical grade uh, testing. And we also have other QC report. For example, this is a circus plot. We can see the ploidy of the uh, cancer and uh, we can estimate the tumor contents 
from this uh, next generation sequencing data. We can look at how uh, the RNA sequencing coverage from the five prime N to three prime N and the hotspot coverage of the important uh, hotspot mutations. And uh, this page is uh, the mutation page. We can show the germline mutation or somatic mutation, give you the list, and we tier them so that you can see what is the important. And uh, this is the example. The, in this patient, we detect this T uh, 790M mutation, which is, uh, this is a non-small cell lung cancer patient. And uh, this mutation actually, it's uh, uh, denote the EGFR inhibitor resistant phenotype. So uh, this is very important to guide the physician how to treat this patient. And also we can uh, detect the copy number change with this data. Uh, you can see in, in this particular tumor, this is the whole genome view. And this is the uh, copy, two copy uh, is at this level. Everything above is, is the copy number gain. And the, everything below the, here is the copy number loss. And we also can detect the, using the mutation, somatic mutation, uh, what kind of mutation we can detect these mutation signatures for each tumor. For example, this is a melanoma patient. We detect the very enrichment of a signature seven mutation. And if you look up the Sanger website of this signature seven, it's a UV signature. So this signature can uh, give us a clue what is, uh, this, uh, what is this tumor uh, what the tumor nature is and also the mechanism of this tumor. And we also uh, incorporate a, a, a useful tool is called a mutation burden. And as you know, lately the uh, immune therapy, the, the most indicative uh, parameter is the mutation burden in the tumor. So if you have a higher mutation burden likely this uh, uh, patient will be re more respon uh, responsive to the immune checkpoint in, uh, inhibitor therapy. So that we incorporate this kind of uh, parameter into this database, you can uh, directly view what is the mutation burden in this particular tumor. And uh, this is the fusion detection. As I uh, showed, this is a, a Ewing sarcoma patient. You can see this uh, T uh, chromosome 11 and 22 translocation. And this is, a, again, this is a balanced translocation. You can see this uh, uh, two, two genes, they just uh, exchange their um, genetic materials at this junction. So there's a other use for genomic information we can derive from this kind of uh, uh, assay. Uh, for example, the HRA typing for the tissue typing. And then we can predict the new antigen prediction. And uh, we can do the gene expression. And uh, gene, with this gene expression, you can, we can do the gene set enrichment analysis and to figure out what kind of pathway is, uh, is altered in this tumor. And then we can also, if we have a survival data, this database can do the survival analysis as well. So in conclusion, the next generation sequencing, including the whole genome exome and transcriptome, uh, determine the complete genomics and the epigenetics portraits of a cancer at the base pair level. And I also show you that the integrated analysis of the cancer can identify biologically relevant diagnostic, prognostic biomarkers and also the targets for the precision medicine. So such a study involve a lot of people. This is like a huge uh, teamwork. And uh, basically the, pro the uh, Clinomic um, program is the collaboration between the genetic branch and the laboratory of pathology. And uh, these are the people I really uh, want to acknowledge.
So I will stop here. I have some time. Maybe you have some question I can answer. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wei. Any questions? No questions from the audience? Sorry, a simple question. I'm wondering the chip sequencing uh, is also uh, in terms of genomics stuff, something? Yeah. Is, uh, chip sequencing is uh, to, to see what the protein binding to what, where the genome is, right? Yeah. The location of the genome. Yeah. So, uh, are you talking about the chromatin immunoprotection? In, in uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but 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 in your two case, you didn't uh, use that approach. Something. Oh, I I mentioned. I just glanced through this one slide. Oh. Has it? I um. Anyway, there's so many things I can talk about. I I just didn't go into it. Okay. Well, maybe I should uh, do it this way. Uh, this one. This slide I was talking about. So this is, are you talking about this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. So, so that's that's the reason I'm saying, you know, that this platform is very powerful because you, you, you can use a single platform, you can derive a lot of information, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so is it correct to assume that in pediatric cancers, mm -hmm. um, germline profiling is most um, effective at the diagnostic level to establish familial cancer syndromes, and perhaps uh, somatic profiling is more effective in the metastatic setting when you perhaps could identify more actionable mutations that may have occurred. Uh, is, actually, not, not really. The, the, the study we showed, that, you know, the study we performed, mm -hmm. they are all uh, sporadic cancer. Okay. So they are not coming from familiar cases. Okay. And the, those sporadic cancer, we can still detect about 10% of those um, patients has the actionable germline mutation. That is just, uh, I, I think that makes sense because this young patient, they, they you know, they haven't, the, contact with all those like um, mutagens right. you know that much mm -hmm. they must have a kind of a genetic component mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. disease mm -hmm. so probably those things is uh, not even uh, appreciated mm -hmm. to, until now we can do such thing in the old time this is almost impossible to answer this kind of right, question right, you right. know right yeah. right so so and and it, on the on the somatic side I think it's very interesting because our study shows about 50% of patients we can identify something. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, in the clinical trial before the precision medicine, basically people just try luck. You know, mm -hmm. if this, mm -hmm. this doesn't work, you try next right. one. But however, somatic uh, profiling is more effective in the metastatic setting. Is, is that not right? Because initially, the tumor itself is not going to have the well, environmental you know, for pediatric cancers. So yeah, I, I think it will be uh, useful for all the patients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the, but the thing you are right in a sense that uh, you know the you, you saw my slide earlier. Most of pediatric patients they respond to current therapy well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there's no point to profile their tumor. Right. Right. right? Okay. Only those people do not respond to the current therapy. Then we need the exactly. okay. we need those kind of things. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So so that's the difference. Okay, yeah. great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, anything else? No. Okay. Thank you, Dr. White. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Hyobin uh, Chen. Um, Dr. Chen received his MD and MS from Shanghai Medical University in China and his PhD degree from New York University. He was a research assistant professor at NYU for four years and then completed an internal medicine residency um, also in New York. He then joined the NCI Medical Oncology Fellowship Program in 2013, and he is now um, an assistant clinical investigator in the thoracic surgery branch. Um, his research focuses on developing novel epigenetic therapies for small cell lung cancer, and as is his talk today, small cell lung cancer. All right. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind of introduction. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. 
So actually, I was in the same chair, you know, back in uh, 2000, uh, 2013. So I also attended the track of class. I think it's very helpful, helped me to expand uh, the, the view on the different type of the cancer. And I'm glad that you are sitting here today. I'm going to talk to you about a, a special type of cancer called the small cell lung cancer. All right, so this is the outline of my today's talk. So I will first give you an introduction. And then I will talk about the genomic abnormalities of uh, this type of cancer. And then I will also give you some examples of a translational medicine uh, in small cell lung cancer. Uh, first of all, so why is it called a small cell lung cancer? Um, you know, as you may have guessed, this is because a small cell lung cancer cells look smaller under microscope than the other type of uh, lung cancer cells. So to give you a feeling how small the small cell lung cancer cells look like, so I actually have a, a pathology slide of a small cell lung cancer uh, here. Uh, what arrow are pointing out, is pointing at is a small cell lung cancer cells, and uh, the arrowhead points to the lymphocytes in a nearby uh, blood vessel. As we know that the uh, lymphocytes are relatively small in, among all the, you know, the blood cells. So the small cell lung cancer cells are just a little bit bigger than the lymphocytes. So the average size of a small cell lung cancer cells uh, is about uh, the 10 micrometer. And compared to the small cell lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer cells are relatively uh, bigger. So in average, it's about a 12 to 15 uh, micrometer. Um, the small cell lung cancer also has some uh, special characteristics. So it actually has a pretty, pretty big uh, nuclei, pretty prominent nuclei, and a pretty uh, small uh, cytoplasm. And in the, this slide, you can see that the small cell lung cancer cells are kind of very closely uh, packed together. And so there's a very few of uh, the meso, uh, the mesodome, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the stroma cells in it. So in general, it looked like, uh, you know, the old grain tied together. So that's why the small cell lung cancer was also called uh, the, uh, the old cell uh, tumor uh, before. Yes. No, uh, I will actually talk about that, uh, you know, in uh, my next slides. Okay. Okay. So. Actually, you know, to address your question, the, the lung cancer actually is, uh, there's a several types of a lung cancer. So there's small cell lung cancer. There's also the uh, lung adenocarcinoma and uh, the squamous cell carcinoma, as well as the large cell uh, lung cancer. And the, the last of three, the adeno, squamous, and the uh, large cells are grouped together, sometimes are called uh, the non-small cell lung cancer because uh, you know, these cancers behave very differently from the small cell lung cancer. So we'll talk about that uh, you know, uh, in a minute. Um, so when the pathology saw this kind of uh, slides and uh, you know, they were suspect of small cell lung cancer, certainly you can't make a diagnosis of small cell uh, just by looking at uh, the HNE slides. So they will actually further do the uh, HC uh, scanning so the common markers they choose to use are the CD56, which is also called the NCAN, which is uh, the neural cell adhesion molecule. And uh, the other two markers that they use is the chromogranny and also synaptifying. So all these markers are expressed in the neural cells. And the reason uh, for them to choose these to stand for the small cell lung cancer is because uh, these type of cancers uh, typically has the neuroendocrine features. So that's why, you know, it will stand positive for these. Um, yeah. All right, so now you, you know uh, how small cell lung cancer look like. And now let's get to some uh, statistics. So the small cell lung cancer actually accounts for about 10 to 15% of all lung cancer cases. And as you may know that uh, the smoking is uh, the most important risk factor for the lung cancer. And this is also true for the small cell lung cancer. And most of the small cell lung cancer patients uh, have about a 30 or more uh, pack year of a smoking history. 
And we mentioned earlier that uh, you know, the lung cancer actually can be roughly grouped into the small cell lung cancer and the non-small cell lung cancer. And we mentioned that the non-small cell actually uh, include uh, the large, uh, large cell and uh, the, uh, the uh, squamous cell lung carcinoma and also the lung adeno. And actually, the non-small cell lung cancer will be talked in the next class by Dr. Zabo. And the reason for them to separate small cell from the non-small cell is because the small cell lung cancer behaves very differently. So first of all, the small cell lung cancer uh, can metastasize really early uh, you know, in its course. So a lot of time, you know, when the patient is diagnosed with a small cell lung cancer, the patient already has uh, the distal metastasis in the brain, in the bone, et cetera. And second of all is that uh, the small cell lung cancer has a very aggressive uh, the course. And the, usually, you know, patient has a very poor prognosis. And in average, uh, you know, the, the median survival of the patients uh, with the small cell lung cancer is about uh, less than one year after diagnosis. And as I mentioned earlier, that a small cell lung cancer has a neuroendocrine feature. So it's not surprising to know that a small cell lung cancer is also associated with uh, some of uh, the endocrine neuropathies, such as uh, the Cushing syndrome. And this is because a small cell lung cancer can actually produce and secrete some of the hormones. In this case, uh, the small cell lung cancer can produce uh, the uh, ACTH, which can stimulate the adrenal gland to produce uh, cortisol, which leads to the, the Cushing syndrome. And so why do we care about the small cell lung cancer? And this is because the small cell lung cancer is uh, causing a significant mortality uh, in, uh, in the United States. So in each year, the small cell lung cancer causes about 30,000 deaths in the US. And as I mentioned that, uh, you know, small cell lung cancer is a pretty aggressive. And so the number of the patients who can survive, uh, for, you know, five years is actually less than 7%. And all this actually uh, makes the small cell lung cancer to meet the criteria to be called a, a recalcitrant cancer. And actually back in 2014, NCI only designated two cancers as a recalcitrant cancer. One is a small cell lung cancer, and the other is uh, the pancreatic cancer. And there's uh, several reasons why a small cell lung cancer is a, a recalcitrant cancer. The first uh, the reason is that uh, uh, it has an uh, insidious uh, onset. It actually can develop in a patient who has quit smoking more than 10 years and there's a no good biomarker or the screening test to identify the small cell lung cancer in early stage. And second of all is that uh, uh, we mentioned that uh, the small cell lung cancer metastasize at a very early, uh, uh, early time. And, and because of this, the systemic treatment is actually the cornerstone uh, the, for the treatment uh, for the small cell lung cancer. And surgery uh, does not uh, play a major role because, uh, you know, oftentimes when patient is diagnosed, tumor has already spread into the other organs. And the third reason is that uh, the, there are not too many lines of uh, treatment for the small cell lung cancer. And also small cell lung cancer can develop uh, resistance very easily. So uh, because of that, and patient will uh, end up uh, not having uh, any treatment options very quickly. And the number four reason is that uh, uh, because uh, small cell lung cancer is, a not, is not a surgical disease. So that's why we actually have a very few uh, the specimens to study. So there's not enough uh, tumor tissues for the clinical, molecular, and the cell biological uh, study. The uh, situation actually has changed uh, after uh, small cell lung cancer is designated as a, a recalcitrant cancer. So more effort and also more funding has been put into the research of the small cell lung cancer and things is uh, changing right now. So let's look at uh, the treatment option for the small cell lung cancer. And actually we can divide uh, the, the area, you know, to like two, two different areas. So one is before 2017, the other one is after 2017. And before 2017, there's only two lines of a standard care treatment for the small cell lung cancer. 
the front line is a platinum plus a topside. This is actually a, a treatment established in the 1980s. And over the past 30 to 40 years, and things has not changed. This is, remains to be the frontline therapy before the 2017. And this is not because of, that's a, a lack of a trying, but oftentimes that we found uh, the, uh, the addition of a third agent will uh, increase uh, the survival uh, slightly, but it causes more uh, toxicity. So in that case, uh, you know, the, the two drug combo remains to be the frontline uh, therapy for the past uh, like 30 to 40 years. The second line therapy, tobotecan, actually was approved in the uh, early uh, 2000. And after 2017, the immune checkpoint inhibitor immune therapy actually has revolutionized the uh, all other type of cancer treatment, including the small cell uh, lung cancer. So now the front line uh, therapy are the chemotherapy in combination with the immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, atezolizumab uh, in this case. And the third line therapy now includes uh, just a single agent uh, immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor. And we will mention about this uh, in the you know, later slides. Uh, I think it's also would be worthwhile to mention that a uh, small cell cancer can also occur in other organs. And so as, a, as shown in this table, the small cell cancer can actually occur in the cervix, bladder, prostate, and uh, many other organs. Uh, they also have a typical uh, morphology as a small cell lung cancer, and also has a very similar kind of uh, the genomic uh, abnormalities. Uh, as you can see that uh, the small cell cancer in other organs are pretty rare. So uh, that made it very difficult to study those uh, small cell cancer outside of the lung. And oftentimes the treatment for these cancers are similar as uh, the small cell lung cancer because that's uh, the, the, the cancer that uh, we have uh, more uh, patients and more experience. All right, so I want to kind of talk about uh, the genomic abnormalities uh, right now. So the most important genomic abnormalities is the uh, inactivation of RB, which is retinoblastoma uh, protein, and also TP53 uh, in small cell lung cancer. And actually back in 1988, um, so actually two years after discovery of the RB uh, tumor suppressor genes, and the investigator in NCI actually thought about that, uh, you know, it should be, uh, should look into the small cell lung cancer. The reason is that uh, uh, in the small cell lung cancer, uh, the chromosome 13Q and 17P are often uh, affected. As we know that RB is actually located in the 13Q, so that actually prompted the researcher here to look into that. So here is a northern blot, uh, the result. Uh, they, they actually look at uh, the different type of uh, the lung cancer, and they look at uh, the expression of the RB, and they found that in the carcinoid, and which is a, a low-grade neuroendocrine tumors in the lung, and also in the small cell lung cancer, they found that there's a loss of RB genes. And then they expanded uh, to, into more small cell lung cancer cell lines. And basically they confirmed that uh, RB is uh, frequently lost. And just about a, like a year later, so uh, John Minner, who was also in uh, NCI at the time and published this paper and report that uh, TP53 uh, is a frequently uh, inactivated in uh, lung cancer, including both uh, non-small cell and the small cell lung cancer. And the method they used at the time uh, was actually not a next generation sequencing. So it was not a very sensitive. Uh, actually, they kind of reported that in some of the small cells, they didn't detect the mutations uh, in uh, P53. And this actually uh, later was, you know, in these cell lines, uh, mutation actually uh, was found by the more sensitive uh, uh, assay. So as I mentioned by uh, Wei, Dr. Wei, uh, in the previous lecture, the next generation sequencing actually has uh, greatly improved our understanding about uh, the uh, genomic, uh, the landscape of a different type of the cancer. And this is also true in the small cell lung cancer. And here is uh, 
a graph that listed the different mutations found in uh, over 100 cases of the small cell lung cancer. As you can see from here that the top two genes that are frequently mutated are actually P53 and RB, RB1. So that actually confirmed the previous finding that these two genes are often uh, affected uh, in the small cell lung cancer. And I will come back to this slide and mention about uh, the other type of uh, mutation found in this, uh, the next generation sequencing uh, study. And during the meantime, uh, you know, we also observed a, a phenomenon uh, in the clinics that uh, the RB and P53 is uh, important for the development of the small cell lung cancer. And we actually found that uh, the patients with a non-small cell lung cancer you know, to start with, uh, after treatment, they actually can develop a small cell lung cancer. So this is a case who actually has a non-small cell lung cancer. A patient has a, a, an activating mutation of a EGFR gene, a LA58R a mutation. So the patient actually was uh, treated with uh, the uh, EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, about a year later, a patient actually developed resistance. So patient underwent biopsy and uh, the patient was actually found to have a small cell lung cancer. And because uh, the small, in, in this cancer, uh, patient actually also has uh, the same EGFR mutation. So that's why we know that uh, this uh, small cell lung cancer actually came from the same uh, progenitor uh, cells of uh, this uh, uh, non-small cell lung cancer. But this uh, small cell lung cancer actually gained additional mutation in the PRC kinase, uh, you know, mutation. And so the patient was, a, was a treated with uh, the chemotherapy and the radiation, and eventually uh, the tumor uh, relapsed. And then patient uh, was a treated with additional tyrosine kinase inhibitor and also additional chemotherapy and the radiation. And eventually uh, patient expired. So at the time, uh, and patient actually was uh, had an uh, autopsy and then uh, different uh, tumors uh, in the body actually was uh, sequenced. So I just want to point out that uh, in two of the small cell lung cancers found in this patient, they actually found that uh, uh, both alleles of uh, P53 uh, were actually uh, was either lost or inactivated because of the gaining of uh, the deletion uh, mutation. In the same study, they actually also look into uh, many other, uh, the, the, the small cell lung cancer uh, developed from the patients with non-small cell. And they look at uh, the, the loss of the RB gene. Uh, the way they, the method they use to detect RB is by the IHC staining. So if uh, there's a no staining of the RB, so that means that the RB is actually uh, inactivated or lost due to the uh, mutation or other genomic uh, events. So as you can see in the blue bo group, uh, boxes here, and all the patients with uh, the uh, neuroendocrine tumors, you know, uh, like the resistant tumors in the lung, they all had a loss of the RB. So again, this kind of uh, stress the importance of a loss of RB and P53 for the development of uh, the small cell uh, lung cancer. And the, the costive role of uh, RB and P53 inactivation to the small cell lung cancer was actually proved about in the transgenic uh, MOS model. So in this uh, transgenic mo uh, MOS model with uh, the uh, deletion of RB and P53 uh, in a tissue specific manner, uh, mouse actually develop these uh, hypoplastic uh, lesions in the airway uh, around uh, uh, six months uh, after birth. And on the right side, which is show that uh, uh, this uh, uh, hypoplastic lesion is, uh, uh, is hyper uh, proliferating. So by showing the very strong the, uh, BRD uh, staining. All right, so I will come back to the RB and P53 inactivation later on to explain, you know, why we think uh, this is uh, actually can cause a small cell lung cancer. And so the
the next two uh, type of uh, genomic ophthalmologies that I want to mention is uh, inactivation of uh, the EP300 and the CRAB BP. And both of uh, these two genes are uh, epigenetic genes. They are histone acetyl transferase. And the third group of uh, the genomic abnormality is inactivation of uh, the notch signaling uh, in the small cell lung cancer. So let's go back to this uh, next generation sequencing study. So besides uh, the activation of a P53 and RB1, so the next, uh, the, the, the group of uh, the, uh, the genes that are frequently mutated are actually EP300 and uh, the CRAB BP. So this occurs in about a 10 to 15% of all small cell lung cancer patients. And another group of genes that are frequently mutated are actually the notch uh, receptor genes. As you can see here that notch one, two, three, four are also affected in the small cell lung cancer patients. And uh, the mutations in the notch receptor genes are actually uh, mutually uh, exclusive. So uh, recently, uh, there actually has been studies to uh, to really investigate what's the significance of uh, the uh, inactivation of uh, these genes. So here, just show that uh, inactivation of uh, CRAB BP genes can actually accelerate development of uh, small cell lung cancer. So what you see here is that uh, the, the mice actually uh, received uh, the pre-cancer uh, cells uh, with or without uh, the CRAB BP1 uh, inactivation. So in the uh, mice that received the CRAB BP inactivation cells, you can see that uh, it actually, you know, uh, the tumor appeared at a very uh, much earlier than the ones that received the, the control cells. And in the transgenic mouse model, uh, in uh, the uh, in the mice that have uh, the uh, triple inactivation, with uh, inactivation of uh, RB one. P53 and also CRAB BP, you can see that uh, mice actually uh, develop a tumor earlier. And so that's a, about, a, like, uh, about a 60 days, about two months earlier than the mice that only has a two genes inactivation, P53 and RB1. So what's the reason for that? So uh, here it shows that uh, the researcher found that uh, the inactivation of uh, CRAB BP can actually uh, decrease uh, the expression of e hearing, which is uh, actually a, a gene that's related to the, uh, the cell's uh, in interaction. So here, as you, this is an immunofluorescent staining. So here just show that uh, uh, in the, uh, the cell uh, tumors that with uh, the three genes uh, knocked out, there's a loss of uh, CRAB BP. But meantime, the expression of e hearing is also significantly uh, reduced. In the meantime, the bimentin and also DAP1, two of the genes that's involved in the, the uh, EMT are actually uh, increased. So they found, they report that uh, the inactivation of the CRAB BP can actually lead to a partial activation of uh, the uh, EMT uh, program. So that's probably the reason why uh, the inactivation of the CRAB BP can actually accelerate the, the development of the small cell lung cancer. So the third, uh, the group of genes that are commonly mutated are actually a notch receptor gene. So here is a, a, a diagram to show you uh, what is a notch signaling pathway. So notch receptors are actually a membrane uh, receptors. So once the receptor is bound to the ligand, so there's a multiple ligands. Some are uh, activating ligands, some are inactivating uh, ligands. So when this bond to the activating ligands, and actually that leads to the conformation change of the notch receptor, and then notch receptor can be cleaved by the uh, gamma secretase. And then the uh, intracellular domain of the notch receptor can be, uh, can be freed and then migrate into the nucleus. So once uh, this uh, intracellular domain uh, come into the nucleus, it actually can bind to the other transcriptional factor and can lead to the activation of uh, gene transcription. So this, uh, the, 
not to intercellular domain can serve as a, a signaling molecules to activate uh, the notch uh, signaling uh, pathway. So to study about the, the function of uh, the notch signaling in the development of the small cell lung cancer, a researcher actually developed uh, you know, the, the transgenic uh, MOS model with uh, the uh, expression of uh, the notch two intracellular domain. So in this way, they can actually turn on the notch signaling and then see whether in this background, uh, whether it can affect the development of the small cell lung cancer once you knock out the uh, RB1 and the P53. So what they found is that uh, the uh, forced overexpression of uh, the uh, notch two intracellular domain can actually decrease uh, the numbers and also the size of the small cell lung cancer uh, developed in the transgenic uh, MOS model. And what they shown here are the quantification to show the decrease of uh, the tumor numbers and also decrease of uh, uh, the tumor, uh, tumor volumes. And on the right hand side, which is a, a survival curve and shows that uh, the, uh, in act, the actually activation of a notch signaling pathway as shown in this red curve, sorry, as, as shown in this black curve can actually prolong the survival uh, of uh, the mice. Uh, okay, so what are the significance of all these, uh, you know, different uh, the uh, pathways uh, in the development of the small cell lung cancer? So this actually uh, is kind of uh, illustrated in a, a very recent study. So uh, in this recent study, they actually uh, look at uh, the, the, the repair of uh, the uh, airway epithelium uh, after the injury. So actually there's a neuro, uh, in the uh, airways, so there's uh, actually neuroendocrine uh, stem cells uh, that actually can mediate the repair uh, after the, the airway uh, injury. So what is just shown here is actually uh, the NEB, which is a neuroendocrine body, which has uh, the neuroendocrine uh, stem cells. At the time when the airway got injured, so the neuroendocrine stem cell can actually initiate the cell renewal. And after renewal, and then these cells can actually uh, start to migrate. And also they can uh, deprogramming into uh, more differentiated cells. And then these cells can further populate and then try to, uh, try to uh, repair the injury uh, in the airway. So um, we actually mentioned that uh, RB and P53. So these actually are the two tumor suppressor genes that control the, uh, the renewal of the neuroendocrine uh, stem cells. So when there's a, a injury in the airway, they actually can be, can transmit our the um, the stimulating signal. So that actually can cause uh, the uh, suppression of the RB and P53. And because uh, these uh, two genes are suppressed, so that uh, this break is uh, removed, so that uh, the neuroendocrine cells can uh, reproduce itself, and then can also and leads to the deprogramming and also differentiation into the other type of cells. And the differentiation of the cells actually is controlled by the notch uh, signaling. So in the case of the small cell lung cancer, uh, you know, the author actually uh, proposed that uh, because of RB and P53 is inactivated. So that's why the neuroendocrine cells can actually reproduce itself without, without the, the, the break, without the control. In the meantime, because the notch signaling is also uh, inactivated, so that, uh, so that uh, the neuroendocrine cells will just uh, keep on going for the self renew and then, and then leads to the, uh, the population of more uh, cancer cells and then leads to the, the distal uh, metastases. Uh, of, so right now, this is still a theory. Still needs to be uh, further uh, further proved. But you know, but based on this model, so it actually give a, 
a meaning why RB and P53 inactivation can lead to the, the small cell uh, lung cancer. So next, I'm going to give you a few examples about uh, the, how the translational research is uh, shaping the treatment uh, for the small cell lung cancer. I will first give you an example about uh, the Robert T, which is actually uh, an unsuccessful uh, story. So we mentioned that uh, notch settling is often inactivated in the small cell lung cancer. So you notice that uh, you know, about uh, 10 to 20% of small cell has a mutation in the notch. So what about uh, the other small cell lung cancer that, that does not have uh, the mutation in the notch receptor? So what's found is that uh, you know, many of these tumors actually have uh, the overexpression of DLL3, which is actually a ligand that can turn off the notch signaling. So here is just to show the uh, expression of uh, DLL3 uh, in the normal lung compared to the small cell lung cancer tumors as well as the small cell lung cancer cell lines. And because this is a log scale, so you can see that uh, the DLL3 is about a 50 to a, a 100 fold higher expression uh, in the small cell uh, tumors or uh, cell lines. So, but how would you be able to utilize this information to develop a treatment? So they actually develop a, an antibody drug conjugate. So they took advantage that a DIL3 is present on the cell membrane. So you actually can use the antibody to target the, the cell membrane uh, protein. So they actually constructed this uh, antibody drug conjugate. So this is an antibody that can recognize DIL3 and then they connected this antibody to uh, a very toxic drug called the uh, uh, PBD. PBD actually is a DNA, uh, the uh, cross-linking uh, agent. And what's in between is a, a very long linker. And so once the drug uh, got into the, gets into the cells, it actually, uh, the linker can be cleaved uh, by uh, enzyme in the cells so that uh, the drug can be uh, released. So how did it work in the preclinical uh, model? So here they actually used uh, the small cell lung cancer patient derived xenograft models. So here show the, the, the ch change of the tumor volumes. So, uh, so look at here, the tumors actually initially was treated with a chemotherapy. So you see a decrease of uh, the tumor volume. And once you stop the chemotherapy, tumor can come back very quickly. So those are black lines re uh, refers to the, the control uh, tumors that did not receive the treatment. And the red, cur the red dots actually represent the tumor volumes in the mice that was treated with antibody drug conjugate. You can see that uh, the tumor volume decreased again and uh, remain, uh, remain low for a pretty long period of time. And on the right-hand side, which just show what happens to these tumors if uh, you re-challenge the tumors with uh, the same chemotherapy. So those were shown in the blue curve. So again, the tumors decrease initially after the first uh, you know, exposure to the chemotherapy agent. And after a while, these tumor came back and if you treated these tumors with a chemotherapy, cisplatin and etopsat again, it went down, but then this time it came back much faster. So this is a very sharp contrast to the, uh, the results obtained through the antibody uh, drug conjugate. So this drug actually went into the clinical trial and in the phase one, uh, they actually reported a very good results. Uh, you know, they actually use a DL3 as a biomarker to uh, stratify patients. So in the patients with a high expression of a DL3, they actually found a 39% of a response rate in the patients uh, treated with uh, this uh, Rover T. In the patients with a lower expression of uh, DL3, the response rate is lower, it's about a, a 18%. So uh, because of the encouraging result in the phase one, they actually move on to do a phase two result and so this is called the, the Trinity trial. So the patients they choose are those uh, who have uh, progressed after two lines of uh, treatment. So in that case, there were two different lines of uh, the chemotherapy uh, 
So then they treated these patients uh, with the Rova T. Uh, you know, uh, the result actually showed a very, a, a very different from the findings in the phase one. So they actually found that uh, the response rate, objective response rate, uh, was actually much lower than what's reported in the phase one. So in the patients with actually high expression of a DL3, they only found that there's a 14% of uh, response rate, and as shown in this uh, waterfall plot, which shows the best response of the patients uh, uh, on this drug. So the median, uh, the overall survival was only 5.6 months in all the patients. So this uh, was not a, you know, very uh, encouraging. So that actually, uh, the company uh, kind of a positive or different development, but a continued uh, phase three trials. And the phase three trial result was also just a recently uh, reported, but, of, but, uh, uh, but was not reported in a, a scientific paper. So we don't know the details. Uh, again, the phase three trial also showed a, a negative result. So this drug actually uh, is no longer uh, being developed. And this is just a one of uh, the unsuccess unsuccessful story, uh, you know, for the in the drug treatment for the small cell lung cancer. And just remind us about the fact that, uh, you know, sometimes when you see a response, but doesn't mean that uh, uh, this is going to actually uh, prolong the survival of the patients. And so, and the next example is actually is uh, to talk about the immune therapy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, immune therapy actually has uh, revolutionized uh, the different type of uh, the cancer treatment. And this is also true in the small cell lung cancer. Uh, so just uh, to keep everyone on the same page, so we'll give a, a very brief, uh, you know, the introduction about uh, the uh, immune checkpoints. Um, so this is a very simplified slides. So there's a, at least a three key players uh, in the immune system uh, in, you know, in the body. So there's uh, this uh, antigen presenting cells. There's also T cells. There's also uh, tumor cells. So the antigen presenting cells actually can process the, the tumor antigens from, uh, from the tumor cells and then present it to the T cells. So once they uh, kind of meet the T cells that has uh, the T cell receptor that can recognize the tumor antigen, then it will stimulate the growth of the T cells. And the T cells then meet with the cancer cells and then uh, the T cell receptor can recognize uh, the antigen presented by the MHC, uh, MHC complex. And then it will actually you know, initiate the, the killing of uh, the, the tumor cells. Uh, so actually tumor cells is also pretty smart. So it actually uh, used uh, the uh, defense system uh, in the normal people. So it actually can use a, a molecule called the PDL1 to actually suppress the function of the T cells. So uh, oftentimes that uh, you can find that uh, the tumor has a high expression of the PDL1, and that's a, a way for the tumor cells to evade the surveillance of the immune system uh, in the body. So the way that immune checkpoint inhibitor works is that uh, it actually uh, uses the antibody to bind to the PD1 or PDL1, and therefore, uh, so well, basically block this uh, PD1 and PDL1 interaction because uh, this interaction is blocked. So the tumor cells cannot uh, uh, inactivate the T cells anymore so that the T cells can now uh, can act on the tumor cells and cause uh, the, you know, to fight against uh, the tumor cells. Uh, so besides uh, the, uh, the tumor cells that can express PDL1 and actually uh, other immune cells such as the antigen presenting cells can also express uh, PDL1. And the main purpose is really to fine tune the, the level of uh, the, uh, the immune reaction so that uh, to really control the immune reaction to a certain level that does not cause uh, the extra damage. Uh, so there's a good reason to believe that a small cell lung cancer you know, uh, will respond to the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, that's because uh, when you look at a tumor mutation burden, 
uh, small cell lung cancer is uh, actually one of the, the, the top cancers that has uh, the high mutation burden. And this is because uh, the small cell lung cancer uh, is uh, mainly caused by the tobacco smoking and tobacco you know, can cause a different type of the mutations. And actually the top five bladder lung adeno, lung squamous are all related to the tobacco uh, smoking. However, you know, when you look at uh, the, the target of uh, the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, then you will be a little bit surprised. So in the small cell lung cancer, uh, you know, the uh, PD-1 and the pd one expression were not found on the tumor cells. Uh, actually, sometimes you can find it in the stroma cells. So here are just the examples. On the top are the two uh, negative standings. Uh, of the small cell lung cancer for the PDL1. So in the panel C, which actually shows some positivity uh, for the standing of the PDL1, but when you really zoom in to look into the detail, you can find that the positive uh, the standing are not on the tumor cells, actually uh, on the periphery of the tumor. Uh, so those are actually the stromal cells. So CD68 is a marker for the macrophage. So again, you can see that the positive standing are in the stromers. And PD-1 uh, is on stromer two. And CD3E is a, actually uh, is, a, uh, is a marker for the general uh, T cells. And then it's also you know, in the stroma as well. So uh, initially people, you know, did not really understand what's the significance of uh, the positive st PDL1 staining on the immune cells. But now there are more and more evidence showing that uh, uh, the, the actually the PDL1 positive immune cells are also a target of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, in the NK cells, uh, in the CL examples, uh, the actually the immune checkpoint inhibitor can actually block the PDL1 on the NK cells and actually can turn on the NK cells. So, so more and more uh, studies are actually uh, focusing on the studying the functions of the PDL1 on the immune cells and we will get more information. And meantime, you know, in a very small percentage of small cell lung cancer, you actually, you do find the overexpression of uh, PDL1. And this is because uh, there's actually the gene amplification of uh, PDL1 gene, uh, CD274. And so in the, all the cases that have the gene amplification, you actually can find uh, the increased expression of uh, the PDL1 on the immunohistochemical staining. But it's only occur in a very small percentage of patients. It's only about uh, like 2% of uh, the small cell uh, lung cancer. All right, so uh, we have already mentioned that uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor has been approved uh, uh, for the frontline as well as uh, the, the third line uh, treatment of the small cell lung cancer. And here, just to give you one example, uh, this is uh, the pembrolizumab uh, trial. So the pembrolizumab is an antibody that can target the PD-1. So in this uh, small study, uh, they actually found that uh, the response rate is about 33%. Uh, and actually in a later uh, a study that combined this study with another study with uh, pembrolizumab, the response rate was actually found to be about 20%, about 19% actually to be exact, uh, in about uh, like 80, 80-ish uh, patients. So what's the uh, catching other people's eyes is really, you know, for the patient who responded to the treatment, as shown in this uh, spider plot, which actually show the change of the tumor volume after treatment, you can see that uh, there's a quite a lot of patients who actually uh, had a tumor shrinkage and, uh, and are able to maintain the, the tumor shrinkage for a very long period of time. So that's a uh, um, uh, precedent because uh, you know, for the patient who was treated with a chemotherapy, and oftentimes that uh, the tumor will come back very quickly. But this uh, doesn't seem to be the case with the immune therapy. And that's, uh, you know, what actually uh, made, immune, made immune therapy, uh, you know, uh, to stand out from all different type of uh, the treatment. Uh, 
in last year, uh, actually, uh, it was reported in the New England Journal that addition of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor to the chemotherapy can also uh, improve the survival uh, of the patient. So in this uh, phase three trial, the investigator actually compared the, the, the treatment uh, of uh, frontline chemotherapy uh, as shown in the yellow line to the, uh, the experimental therapy. That's to combine the chemotherapy with the immune checkpoint inhibitor. As was shown in this, uh, this, the, uh, in this a couple mile survival curve, that uh, the patient who got uh, the chemotherapy with the immune checkpoint inhibitor actually has a, a better survival than the patient who got a standard chemotherapy. And the overall survival improvement is actually not that significant, it is not that big. It's, there's only about a two months, uh, you know, the survival uh, improvement. However, for this kind of deadly tumor, uh, it's actually, it's uh, still quite uh, meaningful because a lot of patients who progressed up to the frontline therapy, they deteriorate very fast. They didn't even, they won't even get a chance to, you know, get a second line uh, therapy. So on the right hand side, it will show that uh, the, the response rate. So just to summarize, so I mentioned that a small cell lung cancer is a difficult cancer to treat and uh, we need a more uh, novel therapy. And, uh, and also put uh, quite a lot of time to talk about uh, the P53 and RB mutation uh, in uh, inactivation in the small cell lung cancer. And the mutation of other genes may facilitate development and also growth of the small cell lung cancer. And I also talk about uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor, which is uh, changing the treatment paradigm of the small cell lung cancer. And again, the checkpoint inhibitor is only uh, effective in a subset of a small cell lung cancer patient. Uh, we still need a more uh, treatment for uh, other uh, small cell lung cancer patients. And I will just, uh, you know, uh, stop here and then I will take questions. Thank you. Questions? I think, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, small cell lung cancer cells, most of them uh, themselves uh, don't have the, the the immune checkpoint marker mm -hmm. uh, targets, but only the surrounding uh, cells, like stromal cells, has the targets. But uh, but uh, but you said the immunotherapy still works very well on small cell lung cancer. Well, I think what what's the what was the gap between this? Thank you. Okay, so yeah, that's a very good question. I think that this is also a question that's still uh, being uh, studied at this moment. So as I mentioned that uh, when you look at uh, the PDL1 or PD1 expression, you can usually you know see that some of the stromal cells, which actually contain the immune cells, are staying positive for the PD PDL1 or PD1. So it's uh, you know it's very possible that. Uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitor can actually act on those immune cells so that uh, uh, these cells can be actually can be turned on to fight against the cancer. So it's possible, yeah. So although we don't have a, a direct evidence at this moment, but based on the observation from other tumor types, so it's it seems like that this could be you know could be the, the actually the mechanism. So if you look at biopsy specimens from patients with uh, small cell who are responding to um, uh, immune therapy, do you see the stroma um, is more um, immunogenic, more infiltrated with T cells? Because I know in triple negative breast cancer, as I had mentioned when I did my talk, and mm -hmm. the patients, the triple negative patients who are better responders, they seem to have more of an inf infiltration. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think in general that is the case. Uh, however, you know, in the trial, uh, you know, a lot of time, it's uh, you know, it's it, it's too, it's retrospect. Too, you go back and yeah, you. Yeah, it's right. a very you know, it's actually uh, it's very difficult to perform multiple biopsies because patient usually patient will get a pretreatment biopsy, mm -hmm. and but you know to really to obtain another biopsy at, during the treatment, it's uh, it's difficult because mm -hmm. it's invasive. And second of all is that uh, oftentimes the timing is also very important because uh, you know a lot of patients actually had a response you know could just 
at the time of the first uh, restaging, and at that time, it's uh, it's already too late. Right, right, right. So it tastes the same. Well, you guys should know the immune checkpoint uh, pathways really well because I think it's all been presented in almost every lecture. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with Dr. Chen that it really has revolutionized oncology care. And um, as I mentioned with the triple negative breast cancer patients, we've really had some good responses. And uh, that's, so- yeah, That's very exciting. And, and so uh, mm -hmm. um, that's my area, but mm -hmm. I think it, across the board, we've seen good responses. So. And the durable responses that we're seeing in small cell, even though it's a small subset of patients within that, but small cell really has not had much advances in maybe 20, true, yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Over the yeah. Over twenty years. Over twenty yeah. years. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so it's exciting. Yeah, it is. All right, that's it, I guess. Okay. Thank yeah. you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs>